Good morning. It's uh, Monday morning, and we live through Sunday again. We had great services yesterday at the Galena First Baptist Church and last night at the Ozark Full Gospel Church. We did a roundtable on hail. It's on the... Uh, it's on my Facebook page and on YouTube if you want to look at it. Uh, Brother Akins and I, we took a deep dive, but it was a quick dive because we just we just discussed it in terms of a few specific things uh, to, to trim down the time. And one thing about it is a place you don't want to go. <laughs> <clears throat> um, just remember... Uh, in the thoughts of all this and the thoughts of Jeremiah, we'll, we'll pick up again this morning in chapter 42, an old slogan uh, from, I don't know how far back. I don't even know who it's original with, but uh, it's something I've heard all my preaching life that the sin will always take you farther than you want to go. and keep you longer than you want to stay. That's the nature of it. And sin itself is a preview of hell in this regard. You can escape sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. By believing in him, believing in Jesus Christ and him crucified, by repenting of your sins, following Christ, committing your life to him, by believing the gospel, that he suffered and died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose the third day according to the scriptures. You can escape the penalty of sin. You don't have to go to hell. In this life, from that moment forward, you follow Christ, the Holy Ghost comes to live inside of you. And you are delivered from the power of sin. The only He enters into you. Does this mean you will never sin? No, because John says if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. We call him a liar. Good morning, Gayla. Good morning, Jordan. Uh, we were sure good last night. But uh, once you're saved, you have the power to say no to sin. Of course, like I say, we don't always say no. It's the power of the cross. The power of the cross. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is your deliverance from sin. And as I said, that sin is a, a prelude to hell. Of course, the wages of sin is death. And you die without Christ, then you're in a hell for eternity. But see, you can always come back from sin. And the way we talked last night and uh, was settled in my mind as we spoke, the reality of that once you go to hell, <laughs> you can't come back from hell. You can always return from sin. You can't get up and go home from hell. You need to make these decisions this side of the grave and not on the other side of the grave. So anyway, we finished chapter 41 on uh, Saturday of Jeremiah, the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, just I won't read all of chapter 41, just the last part of it. And I would remind you that uh, that that King uh, Nebuchadnezzar set up Gedaliah, one of the generals, to be the the governor. And uh, all the people were coming unto him. And it was Uarden, the captain of the guard. He left Jeremiah at his own request uh, in Judah. And, and Jeremiah went to join Gedaliah at Mizpah. And... Uh, they were gathered, Gedaliah was gathering people to him. He said, hey, don't worry about King Nebuchadnezzar serving. Let's go out and let's harvest. Let's gather the fruit and the fruits. Let's make the wine. Let's 
let's get our let's get our fruits in out of the field. Let's get our let's get our crops in. Let's harvest so we'll have something to eat this year. So they're busy doing that, and then Ishmael, aptly named, <laughs> he comes with his men, and he's of the seed royal. So he needs to be king. He's jealous that Gedaliah is the governor, so he kills Gedaliah, the guy the governor had put in charge. Johanan, one of uh, Gedaliah's confederates, one of his mighty men, uh, goes and fights Ishmael and just kills many of his men and drives the rest of them into Ammon. So this uh, would-be king who murdered the governor, he's living in exile among the Ammonites. And we find after that war, everybody is scared. Johanan is scared. He's afraid Nebuchadnezzar is going to come down there and take the rest of them to Babylon because they killed the governor. Even though he didn't do it, he's not going to be able to explain it. So this is what happens. Verse 16 to chapter 41. Then Johanan, the son of Kareah, uh, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people who had recovered uh, from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mizpah. After that, he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even the mighty men of war and the women and the children and the eunuchs whom he had brought again to Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitations of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem. Chimham was one of the sons of Barzillai, and uh, David wanted to honor Barzillai, and Barzillai said, I'm old, I can't even taste my food, do it for my sons. Well, Chimham was one of the sons, and since Bethlehem was the city of David, there in Judah, south of Jerusalem a little bit, it's within walking distance. Uh, well, it's a long walk, but it ain't far down to Bethlehem. Uh, uh, he gave him a possession. That David gave him a nice possession there, so it's a little town outside of Bethlehem, a little suburb, if you will. And so they're gathered there. He goes there. He runs away from Mizpah because the Babylonians, the Chaldean soldiers, they know that they're supposed to be a Mizpah because that's the... That's the uh, temporary capital now that Jerusalem's been destroyed. So good old Johan and he kind of takes all the people he can find and they head out of there and they go south and they stop and they gather and camp and plan there at Chimham. And they plan to go enter into Egypt. Now you know if you've read any Bible at all, you know it's wrong to go to Egypt. <laughs> All kinds of bad things happen when you go to Egypt. It's like going to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I I went to Vegas in a $2,000 car one time and come home in a $100,000 bus. <laughs> it's been a long time ago. <sighs> anyway, God bless Greyhound. They went to Egypt because they were afraid of the Chaldeans, verse 18, because of the Chaldeans. For they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king had made governor of the land. Now, they're camped out around Chimham. They're getting ready to go. Oh, they're doing the harvest and bringing them the fruits, but it's for their journey. They're, they're, they're getting stores for their journey. They're going to go along the coast. They're going to go across the Gaza Strip, which back then was the former land of the Philistines. And uh, I guess, they were, well, there were still Philistines living there at this time. And they were going to go across what was the Sinai Peninsula and into Egypt. And they were going to hide from Nebuchadnezzar down there. Good luck, right? Nebuchadnezzar had already conquered the known world. How are you going to hide from it? Nebuchadnezzar had already defeated the army. The armies of, of, of the empire of Egypt. You know, Egypt was the former empire. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed their imperial armies all over the, the world, 
all over that part of the world and had driven the remnant of them back into Egypt on the African continent. So I don't know what uh, what these Jews thought they were going to hide from Nebuchadnezzar. There's nowhere that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't reach them because he God had made him <laughs> Uh, his his mighty right hand, God used Nebuchadnezzar to put hurt on the world and to judge Judah. So there's no way to escape. So let's just pick it up in chapter 42 with this idea of their head that they're going to go to Egypt so that they can escape all the hard times. Then all, now remember, we find out in this chapter that, that they're just carrying Jeremiah along with him because remember Jeremiah was with Gedaliah at Mizpah. That was his choice to stay in the land. He wanted to stay in the land instead of to leave the land. Then all the captains of the forces, this is verse 1 of chapter 42, then all the captains of the forces and Johanan the son of Kareah and Jezaniah the son of Hoshea, Hoshea and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah, prophet, oh, we want to hear the word of the Lord. You notice how religious people get when they know they're doing the wrong thing? You'll never be more religious than when you're in the middle of sin and you start talking religion. Well, do you think God allows this? Do you think God allowed that? You don't, you don't, you don't want to care. You don't care what God allows. You just want to see what you can get by with. Ha! I had a deacon one time in my first church. We were having a Bible study, we we're talking about wine, and the verse said, uh, said well, what's the difference? It says, it, says, uh, it says a bishop is not to be given to wine, but a, a deacon is not to be given to much wine. What does that mean? Does that mean you can only drink a little bit of wine? <laughs> and I said, I said, look, you don't want to know an answer. You just want to know how far you can push God before he gets mad. You just want to know what you can get by with. You know, when you got a pile of teenagers down at the creek, first base, sooner, sooner or later, first base is going to become a home run. <laughs> if you drink anything at all, sooner or later, you're going to get drunk. I know I'm a drunk. I am an expert on drinking. And I was a drunk until God delivered me from that. That was February the 6th, 1997, about five in the morning. Uh but you see, God delivered me for that. But I know I'm a drunk. I was a drunk. But I'm not a drunk anymore because I serve the Lord Christ. And I know this, that, that most people ain't drunks. Most people can drink a beer or have a shot of whiskey and it don't hurt them. It don't, they don't want more. I want more after a while. And, uh, you know, one is too many and a hundred ain't enough. But let me tell you, I never knew anybody, even the guy who only has a, a beer. Well, after I mowed the lawn, you know, that's a good example of your our Baptist brethren nowadays. I like a cold beer after I mow the lawn. I like a cold beer for breakfast. <laughs> How about that? And the beer I had for breakfast wasn't bad, so I had one more for dessert. You see, <laughs> you try to be righteous. You get real religious, but you're just trying to see what you can get by with. But I never met anybody, even the so-called social drinker or the occasional drinker. I never knew anybody who drank that didn't get drunk sooner or later. I never met that person. Now, I have met a handful of people who drank a little bit and never tested again because they didn't like the way they felt or they, they made them sick or they hated the taste of it. But I never knew anybody that drank and didn't get drunk sooner or later. Not the point. The point is, is that these people, they're at Chimham. They come to Jeremiah, who's in the crowd. He's in the, the people there. And they, they come to him and they ask him to, to talk to God and uh, they're going to want God to tell them through Jeremiah what to do but they don't have any uh, they don't have <laughs> praise God Gala thank God for that there you go there's another one you're one of the rare few uh, I wish I'd have said that I wish I'd have said uh, <laughs> the old general 
Navajo swear word, commandante. It's just a substitute for everything. And throwing that fire water down on the ground. But I loved it the moment I drunk it. I think I was drunk from the beginning. I said, man, this is great. <laughs> but thank God, as I say on so many occasions, I don't have to live that way anymore. You know, when you've lived like I've lived, beloved, I don't encourage it at all. I warn you from it. I beg you to flee it with tears. But at this stage of my life, you know, it's easy to have gratitude, you know, when, you, when you've been living in the bottle. It's easy to have gratitude, man, because if I wake up and I'm sober and in my right mind and not in jail, that is a magnificent way to start the day. I ain't in jail and I'm not crazy. I like that idea. I want to keep on doing that until either the Lord comes for me or I go to him. Well, let's see what these uh, wildly scheming, conniving uh, Jewish leaders were doing to old Jeremiah here. Then all the captains of the forces and Johanan, the son of Kareah, and Jezaniah, the son of Hoshea, and all the people from the least, even unto the greatest, came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let us, we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee. See how religious they're getting there. No, they're wrong. The more wrong you are, the more religious you'll get. Because <laughs> you want somebody to bless you when you know that you need to be cursed and stopped and stomped. Because we all have a conscience. We all know when we're wrong. Or most of us do. Some of us ignore it, but most of us know when we're wrong. And said, so let our supplication be accepted before thee and pray for us unto the Lord thy God. Here's another tale. Why didn't they say the Lord our God? You notice that? Pray to the Lord thy God. See, that's being religious. They, sh they were, if, if the Lord was their God, they would have already been praying. And if they wanted Jeremiah to pray with them, they would have said, hey, we've been, we've been making supplication to the Lord our God. Will you pray for us? Will you pray with us just like the people asked Samuel? And he said, God forbid that I should cease to pray for you. You know, that's the job of a prophet. Of course, uh, uh, Eli was a priest too. Uh, technically, the job of a prophet is to represent, uh, I mean, Samuel was a prophet also and a priest. Uh, the job of a prophet is to represent God to man. Technically, the job of the priest is to represent man to God. But see, Samuel was both. Jeremiah was both, you see. Now, he, wasn't, he, he, he got thrown out of his office as a prophet when he was probably 17, 18 years old. They stole his wife away from him, or the one who would have been his wife. We're a little unclear about that. But, uh, but, but he was a prophet and a priest, just like Samuel was. Uh, and so the people, they said, pray to the Lord thy God, not the Lord our God. And that should have been a tale right there. And he, and he knew on some level, he knew. Pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us. Oh, take pity on, see how few of us are left. But we don't want to die like all the multitude that was dead and all the multitude that was carried into captivity. You see, we're a remnant. God must have left us here for a reason. God's already shown them what the reason is. He showed them through the naming of Gedaliah, their kinsman, as their governor, so they could stay in the land, so they could just go home, they could harvest, they could plant, they could live. They had the chance to live. You know, never underestimate that. Never discount that. The, the, the opportunity to live is a great thing, beloved. That the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. They're asked, tell Jeremiah, we want you to ask God to tell us what to do. Tell us how to walk. Tell us what to do. But they're already doing what God doesn't want them to do. You know, if you've ever been in a love affair, you can think of every reason why you ought to continue it. You can come up with a kind of a seemingly selfless, unselfish reasons to do it. 
you know, you can even bring God to it, but God will not bless what he's already cursed. God will not tell you to leave your husband or wife. God will not tell you to shack up with somebody else. God will not tell you. <laughs> Under most conditions, God will not tell you to quit your job when you have no other source of income unless he has already shown you and provided a way for you to survive. And people, you know, I got to tell you, and I've had to rely since I got sick, I've had to rely on the kindness of friends. And it's really God acting through my friends, both in and out of the ministry, uh, supplying things for me to do. Uh, but uh, I've always believed that, yeah, that, you know, the, the, the guy with his head in the clouds will say, you know, God will take care of me. God will provide. And yes, he does. He absolutely does. But beloved, <laughs> the Lord thy God, the Lord my God, he usually takes care of us by our paycheck. That's how he takes care of us. And you find this throughout the Bible. Um, uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the, this industriousness, the industriousness, this dedication to work. So I've always had a I had a soft spot in my heart for bivocational preachers because that's all I ever was. I never preached in a church big enough to pay me a real salary that I could live on. My goal was always to tithe more to the church I was pastor of than they were paying me, and that's happened a couple of times, but not often. <clears throat> but anyway. And they already knew the way they should go. They should have stayed at Mizpah. They should have clung to Jeremiah and taken whatever Nebuchadnezzar dealt them. He had been kind to them before. Maybe he'd be kind to them again because of Jeremiah. You see, and Nebuchadnezzar had a, had a good feeling about Jeremiah. Jeremiah told the people to give up and quit fighting. And that was good for Nebuchadnezzar, so he liked that. Nebuchadnezzar was very, the word we hear nowadays, transactional. Well, he was very transactional. Jeremiah was trying to convince the people to do what Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to do, but it was only because it was what God wanted them to do. That's why Jeremiah was trying to, to get them to get them to give up and quit fighting, because God was using Nebuchadnezzar to punish Judah. And so that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. You see how religious that is? They're very, they're very religious. Uh, the more wrong we are, the more religious we get. The more religious we get, the more wrong we are. You know, we serve a real God who deals with us face to face. He deals with us personally. He deals with us immediately. He deals with us intimately. You don't have to go to the Pope. You don't have to go to a board. You don't have to go to the Presbytery. You can go straight to him. You don't need any intermediator, any intermediary between you and Christ. And Christ is the intermediary between us and the Father. The mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. Why do they call him the man Jesus Christ in that word? Because it was a man who was crucified on the cross. But it was God who hung there. He was 100% God. He was 100% man. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. He was the Son of God before Bethlehem too, but that's not the point of this chapter. Let's go on. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I've heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God. Now, see, he's trying to encourage you. There. He knows that God is, is not their God because they don't really trust in him. They don't really believe in him. They're just trying to get Jeremiah to approve of their actions so they won't have this crazy preacher yelling at them the whole time they're trying to do what they want to do anyway. Why do you think all these rich people give money to these big churches? They're trying to buy a way into heaven. Sometimes I think, you know, the old saying is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Stephen King said the road to hell is paved with adverbs, and I think he's probably right. Um, the road to hell 
I believe is paved with earnest religion. Because the whole world is religious in one way or the other. Got all these idiots running around now. They worship the earth. They worship the climate or they they worship well anytime you worship anything besides Jesus, you're worshiping the devil. The more wrong you are, the more religious you become. But Jeremiah is trying to encourage them. He says, the Lord, your God. They said, the Lord, thy God, Jeremiah. He says, he's trying to encourage them now like a good, good pastor ought to do because he's doing a pastor's job right now instead of a prophet's job. He is actually doing a pastor's job. He, he's trying to, He's trying to herd this this flock in the right direction when he knows that he has no power over them at all. They're going to do what they want to do. I've heard you, Jeremiah said, Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. I'm going to tell God just exactly what you told me, and I'm going to pray about it. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you. I will declare it to you. I will keep nothing back from you. I'll get the truth, nothing but the truth, the whole truth. So help me, God. I'll get it from the Lord our God. And you see how inclusive he's trying to be? He knows that these people are doing this just for their own benefit and just to make a show. They're being religious. But Jeremiah is trying to get them, and he has been trying to his entire his entire career as a prophet, he had been trying to turn them to God. You know, that's what that's what all prophets should be doing. All preachers should be doing that. All pastors turning the flock back to the Lord. You know, preacher, are you sheep hearing your voice? You know. It could either be one of two things. If your sheep don't hear your voice, which ought to be the Lord, you then you don't have, you, you're not giving them the word of the Lord so they can hear it because Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Either that or they're not saved. See, either you're not giving them the word or they're not saved and both of those things can be remedied. You can repent and preach the word of God and the lost can get saved. Quit being satisfied to be a pastor to unregenerate people. Bring them to the Lord. Beg them with tears. Cry and pray over them daily until they get saved. People will have problems. People will have struggles. But don't waste your life pastoring an unregenerate congregation, an unsaved congregation. Don't do it. You got better things to do. You're working for the devil when you do it. Well, that's another subject, too. I don't have time to get off on that. Where is the time gone this morning? What a deal. Jeremiah says, Whatsoever the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Keep nothing back. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us if we do not even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee unto us. In other words, while well, we're going to be true and faithful, whatever the Lord says we'll do. Well, why should we believe them up to now? They haven't done a thing that the Lord told them to do. So why should we believe them now? Why should Jeremiah believe them now? But Jeremiah wants to believe us. And again, the Jews, Jewish leaders, they call the Lord, the Lord, thy God, Jeremiah's God. They, Jeremiah calls him our God, our Lord. Jeremiah calls him the Lord, your God. But they say the Lord, thy God. And that had to have hurt Jeremiah. I know, I know it hurt God. And then they said, whether it be good or whether it be bad, whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee. Hey, Jeremiah, this is our idea. 
We want you to go find out. You get the word and give it to us and we'll do it. Well, they have no, <clears throat> no evidence that they will do it. They have no evidence in their lives up to this point that they have ever obeyed the word of God. But Jeremiah is faithful and he's asking as a pastor. He's acting as a pastor now. He's okay. He may be thinking, I don't know how much you get this will do, but I'll go to the Lord and I'll find out for you. They said to Jeremiah, the Lord be true and faithful. Witness between us. If we do not, even according to all the things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord, our God. You see, they, they called him the Lord thy God in the verse before that. Now they call him the Lord our God. Maybe Jeremiah didn't look like he was convinced, and they so they changed the word from thy God to the Lord our God. They said it right there in verse 6. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. You know what? They had the right idea. Things would be well with them if and when they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. But they didn't obey the voice of the Lord that God. They had never obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God. And as we will find out, they will not this time either. You know, the whole idea of repentance is that you turn and go the other way. And these pretenders were going the same old way. They were looking for an easy way out. They saw where their sin had brought them to chim him with the Babylonians on their heels and no place to go. As soon as Nebuchadnezzar finds out about the murder of their governor, Gedaliah, all hell's going to break loose. They're going to wish that they was back in a cave somewhere over there in Ammon where they were at Gibeon where they'd been taken prisoner until Johanan went and took them back. But, you know, I can't help keep thinking about that line. This is a perfect example. They found themselves in the situation where they were buried in their sin. And they, they could only see one way out, and that was to obey. But they had no intention of obeying. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. We'll pick up in Chapter 42 tomorrow. This may be a long run because it's a long chapter and there's a lot in it. Love and hugs. God bless you.